that was rough. Why don't you just take the night off? <laughs> Your game's looking weak. You could use a little help leveling up. <laughs> Go again. <laughs> Your game stinks. You're gonna need these. Stay in your game with DoorDash. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sam Zimmerman. I'm the head of programming at Shudder. And last week, we released VHS 85. 85 is the latest freak out in the long running innovative found footage anthology series. And today, in celebration, we take a look back at the beginnings of VHS and chronicle the franchise's journey with some of its most exciting filmmakers and contributors. And maybe we'll tell you a tiny bit about what's next. First, our panelists. You know his films The Ritual, The Night House, and last year's latest vision of Hellraiser. But he goes all the way back to VHS 1, where he kickstarted the original film with three iconically creepy words, I like you. From that film's amateur night to producing 94, 99, and directing the stunning total copy in VHS 85, Mr. David Bruckner. Wow, sabotage you got. It's very exciting. The latest era of VHS started with the reinvigoration of VHS 94 and the creative and production shepherding of our next guest, producer of 94, 99, and 85, Mr. Josh Goldblum. Oh wow, you got sabotage too. For her, we hail Ratma. Her impeccably crafted Thriller Watcher came out last year, it's on Shudder now, and in VHS 94, she gave us a freaky sewage-soaked gem in Storm Drain, Chloe Acuno. For VHS 99, the director of Tragedy Girls blended the era of American Pie with Greek mythology for a Medusa massacre on suburban brats. The mind behind Gawker's Tyler McIntyre. And finally, she directed the innovative slasher Lucky, which is also now on Shudder, before helming the performance art virtual reality nightmare techno god in VHS 85, the brilliant Natasha Carmani. So before we uh, really kick it off, we're going to take you all the way back. We're gonna show you the very beginnings of VHS with a little clip from Mr. Bruckner's Amateur Night. Uh, tell me what you think when you, when you see that, when you think back to the original VHS, the beginnings of it, it's kind of raw, the provocative nature of it. What was, what was the creation of VHS? Uh, it's been a while since I've seen that, actually. Uh, uh, no, it's great. I, uh, I, I stand by it. I was like, <laughs> there was a, it was a, a, an interesting time for me. So this was, we shot that in fall of 2011. We had a uh, kind of a creative co-share in Atlanta. So it was like a, a, a shared office space that a bunch of artists pitched in on. And uh, everything from like video editors to VFX crew to like um, a few actors, a few writers, and uh, that stairwell is actually the stairwell up to our offices. So it was very much the uh, you know the experience making VHS was one um, we used to say like no budget independent films was like you know they're made with bubble gum and duct tape like you're barely holding the whole thing together. I think I think I got sent. Uh, $22,000 to make that short. Um, at the time, uh, I wasn't communicating with any of the other filmmakers. I had just gotten a message from Brad Miska and, uh, who, uh, and, and, and Roxanne Benjamin, who was producing at the time. And the mandate was like, go make a great VHS short. Like, go out and go do a found footage short and just have fun with it. So 
we had this group of creative cohorts around us. Uh, I like to say it was kind of a frictionless environment. So uh, it was very much off the studio radar. It was uh, before production had really flooded the Atlanta scene. So you could just kind of do things really down and dirty and that was very much the spirit of it. So naturally we would use anything and everything around us. So again, that's the stairwell to our office. That's actually my arm uh, with the broken bone because we had to reshoot that because we didn't like the way the original gag went off. So I think, I think it was just me and uh, the SFX guy who had rebuilt the arm and we were just grabbing that shot at like midnight one night. And some of the other co-share people had uh, brought some clients in to show them the office in the middle of the night after entertaining them. And, they, and they've just found me and this other guy and I'm like in, the, in the, 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 the wardrobe, which is like a pair of boxers and a bloody t-shirt, just laying on the ground screaming and pointing a camera at my own arm. And uh, that's just the way we did it then. We just go and do it. So uh, yeah, that was very much the spirit of the time for me in the journey of filmmaking and, uh, uh, and VHS was something we just ran at and we sort of, no holds barred, just did whatever we wanted, so yeah. Uh, I'm curious about a kind of two, two tendrils of this, you know, Amateur Night itself has had its own sort of life, both from how it's been influential to people, but also there was a, a film based on it, so I'm just curious how it sits with you now, what you think of kind of this own life it has had outside of VHS, the anthology. I mean, I think I, it's been great to see it stick around. It's been great that I like you, which seemed like a joke to us at the time has persisted in some ways. Um, Hannah Fearman, uh, who plays the, the siren or the succubus, depending on how you want to look at it, was um, uh, Lily is the character's name. Uh, she was a friend of mine at the time, so it's been awesome to see her work persist in that way. Um, I like to have a certain humility about it because it, you just never know when you make this stuff what's gonna stick around and what isn't. Sometimes you think you have a hold of something that will absolutely persist or absolutely catch fire and you never really know. So it's, um, I, I'm grateful that it's around. I'm kind of mystified by it. It's exciting to me at the same time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think too it was, uh, if that short is scary to some people, I think a lot of it has to do with like, you know, the creeping subtext to it, the fact that it's like a send up of bad male behavior, that there's some, um, interesting look at male gazy stuff in it that at the time we thought, you know, you can, you can build tension around that. That can be the bedrock on top of a short. And so if you feel anxious watching the short or if you feel uh, uncomfortable or complicit because you are forced to take on the POV of the camera uh, with these characters that are engaging in some bad behavior, uh, then when the blood starts to hit the wall, all that has more of an impact because it's kind of summoned all this nasty stuff to the surface is the idea. Um, and we were interested in that at the time. And so maybe that has an effect on it. Maybe not. I don't know. Absolutely. Um, for, for both you and Josh, you know, Josh, you came onto the franchise in 94. Um, how did the two of you want to approach, you know, it had been some years since viral. Uh, the reinvigoration of what VHS was and, you know, what you wanted to change, but also what did you want to carry through from the original? What ethos, like, how did you, what did you want to imbue this, these new era of films with? Oh, God. Um, you know, when I came on the VHS 94, uh, the project was almost entirely different. And um, David had written the script uh, Chloe was attached. We had Radio Silence, uh, who's been directing the new Scream movies. And I think what was exciting about that, which we've never really been able to get back to and capture, was that was the first time where like, we were gonna be sharing a lot of um, cast and locations. And it was just, you know, we, we would still have the segments, but like, for example, Radio Silence would come on and just direct the finale of the film. And so it felt like what we were doing was something that was like a bit cutting edge in anthologies that we don't normally see. Uh, but then the fucking pandemic happened and just kind of interrupted everything. And I think it was just like, you know, David went off to do Hellraiser. Uh, Radio Silence went off to do Scream. And I th yeah, I think for me, it was just like, as a fan of VHS, um, 
it was really just about like piecing together all of our favorite filmmakers and just like really leaning into the segments and being able to like have creative fulfilling um, infrastructure. But I mean, as Chloe can attest, shooting that was just chaos. I mean, we shot, uh, in the, during a pandemic, she was, uh, you guys know Ratma, right? Storm Drain? I mean, I think like day one during a pandemic, we were like actually in a sewer. <sighs> yeah, that was, <laughs> was really insane. Um, I hope, I don't know if we just sort of jump, jumped Go for it, ahead. yes. <laughs> Tell us all about being in a storm drain. Yeah, I mean, I had, I had written this, this uh, short that takes place in a storm drain. Uh, and I remember early on getting a call from, um, I think the original line producer, or I don't know, some, somebody who was kind of like, are you sure you can even do that? <laughs> like, you might want to start thinking about some backups. So I was like frantically like, oh God, like what can I do that's still creepy and like works for the story but isn't a storm drain? And then we got really lucky in some ways because our DP, Jared Rabb, uh, had shot a web series in a storm drain, <laughs> coincidentally. So he like took us on the tour of the storm drain and it was really, really perilous, honestly. It was like, it had just rained. There was like water, like, I don't know, like almost like two or three feet up, I feel like. And every part of me as we went deeper into this drain was like, this is a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> Why are we doing this? Um, but I'm, but it, in, in a way, it was like, this is a testament to the fact that we have to shoot here because if this makes people like a tenth as nervous as this is making me, then it'll, it'll all be worth it in the end. So We did, we did end up shooting the rest of um, the sewer in a hotel. <laughs> that is true. It we, was half sewer, half set. <laughs> we did, we were, like, during the pandemic, we had to build most of our sets like inside of like, what was it? It was like an atrium? It was the atrium of a Holiday Inn. <laughs> <laughs> There's some movie magic for you. <laughs> Chloe, um, Rama almost kind of instantly caught on as kind of a, a fan favorite in this thing. I mean, can you talk about the creation of the idea of Rama, but also the creation of it, um, how it eventually ended up looking, all, all the fun stuff? Yeah. Um, the idea, it, it came from a few different places. I think I'd, I had seen um, <laughs> this, this kind of famous uh, news story that has circulated on YouTube of like people talking about a leprechaun in Mobile, Alabama, which you should watch if you haven't seen it. It was like very, very direct influence on um, the news story in Storm Drain. And I just was tickled by the idea of, you know, people talking in this very dismissive way about a very stupid monster, um, and then going in and saying that it's very real. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, rat, in, in some ways it's like, what's the stupidest thing? A rat man, of course. Um, and David actually ended up connecting me with this brilliant concept artist named Keith Thompson, who I believe did your uh, The Monster and the Ritual, did work on Hellraiser. Um, and we had a really long conversation about what the creature would look like. He, he kind of pitched this very different idea about like a rat mother thing that like the, its minions like feed off of its teats and like that would have been cool too. <laughs> but we, I, I, think I, I think I ended up telling him, you know, obviously I think Alien, the Xenomorph from Alien was an influence. I think I, I showed him like the Brundle pod from The Fly and just something that seems kind of like piteous and sickly and weird. But honestly, I feel like a lot of the, the brilliance of the design is Keith's work. Um, and then in terms of actually like building the suit, that was all Patrick McGee, who's also completely brilliant, uh, and managed to ship it to us, I think like the day before we had to shoot it. Uh, so it was- He had like 12 days was crazy. from like beginning um, the design of, or not the design, like the creation of the Ratma prosthetic yeah. to like getting it, shipping it over to Toronto, which is where we shot. I remember tracking it. <laughs> and it was like, it got stuck at FedEx. And you're it's like, very stressful. <laughs> you're like, is somebody gonna open this and see a fucking like rat monster? Like, what are they gonna do? Can I shout out to my favorite Ratma meme, which was that there was a Ratma Macy's Day uh, float. <laughs> so, marketing opportunity, I'm not real sure if we wanna. I hope no one got stuck life. in the pants. Yeah. Um, 
Tyler, there's something very interesting to me about 99, the way kind of 94 shifted to 99. I want to hear David, Josh, and Tyler, all your thoughts about it. But it seems to me that in, in one, in two, in 94, this discovery of tapes is very much a thing. And in 99, you shifted to sort of the tape itself. You're watching something taped over generationally, uh, you know, analog cursed in some way. Can you talk about like the creation of that approach to the wraparound and Tyler, how you wanted to approach it, but also in collaboration? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I was pumped to get the call um, just because like I was such a big fan of the original VHS. Like that came out like when I was finishing film school, and I was you know as a horror fan, I was just like it was the best thing out there for for you know for a minute, and and so I was you know kind of following those filmmakers you know in their careers and everything, and so. Um, it, you know, I was excited to, you know, like, you know, kind of hear about it. And, and then uh, when Josh kind of told me, it's like, you know, it's, it's 99. And I was like, but you just did 94. So like, it's like, w like, how was that? You know, like, 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 w like, what is the evolution exactly, you know, in terms of, uh, and so, uh, but they also w were doing it at the same time as 85. Um, so it was a bit kind of like, well, we're sort of trying to find segments and then we'll sort of place you guys like within the movies. And so I started kind of brainstorming ideas for both. And then, um, you know, I was really just going, uh, you know, because I, I was like maybe 14 in 1999. So I was trying to like think of all the things that I was anxious about back then. And one of which was kind of American Pie. Like, you know, and, and uh, I started thinking about those sorts of like, you know, how those sorts of like the idea of sort of like there's a scene, the very famous sequence in that, in that movie where there's just a bunch of kids like watching somebody undress on, on the Internet. And it's played like comedy. And, and then you, when you watch it now, you're just like this is crazy, you know, like, and, and kind of like where, you know, social media has gone and everything. And so, um, I thought there was some kind of interesting kind of anxiety to dig in around that. And, um, yeah, we, uh, and so once we, um, you know, uh, and the, when I was kind of tasked with the idea of doing like a wrap, the wraparound, which has always been a bit of a challenge. Like that was a tough well, one that, the uh, from like VHS one on. And, um, so the, prevailing strategy was why don't we just not do a wraparound? Like, why don't we just try and do something that is, um, doesn't have to hold, like I believe, like David said, like narrative weight in the same way. And so we started kind of talking about like, well, what could that be? And then the idea became like, well, why isn't, why don't we just kind of see snippets and then that maybe becomes a segment. And then that way, like my segment was supposed to be kind of like shorter. And so I wrote like 12 pages and that was supposed to be like, like a sort of mini one where you'd see sort of snippets. And then once we actually shot it, um, like I sort of shot, like the idea was that we shot this like, um, sort of a mini movie, like one of the characters is 14 and he like is, is directing like this movie with army men that gets more and more elaborate. And so I shot these kind of out of context stop motion scenes and then people just thought they were kind of charming. And then, so I think Chad sort of suggested that like, why isn't, why isn't that the wraparound? And then, then we had to, you know, I had to shoot a bunch more stuff in my living room, but, um, but it was, uh, you know, it, it, it ended up being like, I think kind of really working for what it was in that, in that it, you know, you're, you're, kind of seeing something that's so out of context and then eventually it sort of fills itself in. It, you know, you also kind of spectacularly finished that segment with the reveal of, of Medusa, essentially, which was kind of wild to bring this Spoiler like- Spoiler alert. Oh, sorry, sorry. I mean, they've seen it. They've, they all subscribe to Shudder, every single one of you. Um, bringing that sort of like classical mythology or that classical creature into it, how did you arrive at that? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I, I really wanted to do something that was a bit more of like a rear window kind of thing. Like the, like uh, none of the other segments uh, up to that point, which was kind of surprising to me, had been about like, kind of like stalking somebody. And every time you're kind of in a point of view where you're sort of watching somebody, you're not sure who's behind the camera. I wanted to kind of you do some element of that, except where you're very aware of who's behind the camera. And so uh, once we uh, kind of started kind of digging in around, around those themes, then um, it was about becoming, uh, or brainstorming essentially monsters that had something to do with gaze. And, and you know, we kind of stumbled right onto the Medusa and it, everything just sort of seemed to kind of click. And then, uh, you know, it's just about like working with Pat McGee to kind of figure out like what that looks like. And then also trying to pull like era appropriate references. You know, I was looking at things like species and things like that, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know if anyone's seen that movie, I mean, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, kind of a weird sort of reference because it doesn't look great, but we kind of wanted to kind of have like that vibe, like that kind of weird sort of lizard kind of quality to it. And, um, and yeah, it was just a lot of fun. Amazing. Uh, Natasha, your segment in VHS 85 Techno God has very real references, a very real root, both in, in a type of performance, but also in some of the technology that's on display that kind of looks funny now, but was real. Can you talk a little bit about where it came from and what people might see? 
Yeah, I mean, I think 85 was really interesting because it's it we really threw it all the way back, um, which which was cool and exciting. And I think, it, in a strange way, I think all of the filmmakers, it's such an incredible lineup of directors, and all of us sort of instinctively, without even talking about it, all ran as fast and as far away from Stranger Things as we could. <laughs> and so that kind of meant moving away from the like glossy nostalgia of 85 and into the, the sort of gritty realness of 85. Um, so the writers always Cooper and I um, turned to a space that's very familiar to us, which is sort of like a, you know, back alley, black box, independent theater, performance art, um, and started to, to sort of imagine our story in that setting. But what was really cool is the more we delved into actual archival videos of artists and thinkers and philosophers from 1985, the more we uncovered a really direct dialogue to our lives right now, to 2023. You know, things as, as uh, sort of obscure as the idea of, of virtual reality, of artificial intelligence, of sort of what, does, what is the nature of reality, to something as specific as literally referring to VR goggles as iPhones in, in 1985. That's what, you know, that's what they called it. So I think that was, um, it was part of the process of going, uh, trying to dive into something that isn't something that people no, now think when they think of 1985. Um, and that was just an instinct, I think, that all the filmmakers had to, to go gritty and ugly instead of shiny and neon. And I mean, can you talk a little bit about what this artist encounters in there? Because there is something really interesting, I think, in the VHS series about, you know, like tape and both technology, but also the occult nature of it and what it can call down. Yeah, totally. I mean, look, we're the sixth movie, which is insane, um, and also a testament to like the <laughs> evolution of this series. And so I think all of us were, were, were diving into concepts that were a little bit bigger beyond maybe what you would expect in a found footage movie, and that even included you know, the style and sort of challenging and pushing the limits of what found footage could be. But thematically, absolutely, I think um, you know, using, using this artificial world that's sort of this Tron-like, lawnmower-esque world to um, explore what, what threats may lie, right? So technology, a tool is neither inherently good nor is it inherently evil. I think the, the anxiety, the horror, is, is whether or not you know, we as the wielders of this tool are, are, are worthy of it, right? And I think that is yet to be determined. But <laughs> that's sort of the backdrop of it. And I think also the... Um, you know, we really wanted to do a movie that was a one-two punch. Our pieces, like Tyler's, intentionally very short. Um, we wanted to do something that was uh, like just a, a setup and a payoff. Um, and the performance piece felt like the right place for that. Um, so yeah, we started, the, the whole creative process really started with the end image. Um, and then we sort of moved backwards from there. But it all started with that image of, uh, you know, our brains being eaten by our tools <laughs> and our technology. Uh, David, you have this kind of wonderful full circle thing of kicking off the first VHS with Amateur Night. Uh, with 85, you know, your piece acts as a bit of a wraparound, but also the finale. Um, you also employ kind of two different styles of found footage, obviously, in Amateur Night. It's very POV heavy. It's really kind of raw and unbridled. And this really takes the form as a TV documentary. Can you talk a little bit about that approach and also what you wanted to achieve with Total Copy? Because it, it ends up in that place of this really stunning long one take chaos. Yeah, um, well I mean I think the genesis of it was we knew we needed to do a wrap of sorts. We had to kind of continue the conversation that we started in 99 um, with Tyler's piece and we loved the idea of the mixtape that instead of some kind of wraparound coming in and needing to explain to the audience the origin of the tapes, we felt like that ship had sailed. We, I think we abandoned it in the series after the second VHS. Um, but there was something rhythmically about coming back to something that was valuable. There was also something that kind of houses all of the movies or frames them. And so this tape over concept was still super interesting to us. It also kind of clarified the idea for the audience that you are watching this relic from the era, cover to cover, with all the nasty tape distortions that it might have. I think we all got a little bit lost in the analog flavors of that. We owe a lot to like the glitch art. Movie. Well, you were actually like glitching these tapes. Yeah, we actually dumped. Uh, we shot actually. Uh, uh, Alexander Chinisi, our DP, shot it on a uh, like forty-year-old Magnavox, and uh, then we transferred it to VHS. 
and uh, and then we just like took a VCR apart. And we were just like tickling the tape as it was running through the VCR. So all the glitches are real. How many cameras died in the making of Total Copy, Dave? I think we lost two or three. I'm not even sure to be Pour honest. One, one were... was like day one of the shoot, right? <laughs> yeah. The, the two... I just want everyone who believes that these VHS films are not authentic to VHS to hear that. Yeah. 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 The haters. I mean, the tubes were going out in the camera as we're shooting. So you're getting these weird scan lines. All the lights are bleeding across the image and uh, you know if there's something liberating about spending Shutter's money and watching the image <laughs> deteriorate on set and just going fuck it this is awesome also we're so trained we're to at like, the apex of streaming quality <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's also just like you know you're so trained to create beautiful images it's it's really fun to be after this degradation in some way so of course all of us I think lose our minds on just the tech side of that but um but no, we wanted to continue the, this, this tape over conversation. And uh, we started brainstorming the idea of if it, you know, w what if it was like a different medium? What if it was something where every time you cut back to it, you knew exactly where you were at? And also, like, would it sort of prop up the more immersive singular POV found footage kinds of segments? If it, like, what would it be like to experience a piece of like finished curated media? that maybe was shot by this understudy uh, of the scientific experiment who is not a seasoned cameraman, so it's still a little rough around the edges, but it's been edited by the Total Copy news show. Um, what would that look like and feel like? And, and if we employed a voiceover, like you'd kind of come in out of these you know, scratchy endings to the tapes, and then you would just land in this voiceover and you'd be like, okay, this has a flavor. And part of it was, you know, that we went last, so we had the ability to watch all the other VHS tapes as they've been completed for 85, and we sort of thought uh, it'd be really great to sort of harmonize a little bit of these styles and influences through this. So there were a lot of things that kind of went into coming around to that, and it was a total blast to create this finished documentary of the age and just ape the style and flavor of that throughout. Um, uh, a lot of laughter on set, a lot of fun bringing that to life, but we knew that at the very end of it, um, we, you know, part of the found footage challenge to me, and especially going back to it, is that you, you have to roll this POV first person perspective, hopefully unbroken kind of long take. I mean, found footage is looked at in one light in the horror sensibility, but in another side, it's like Children of Men or, you know, 1917 or these more esteemed kind of immersive pieces of cinema. It's like you are doing that. And um, when you're tethered to a camera, you have to create a happenstance circumstance for the beats to land. You still have to create beats. You still need the peaks and valleys of any other kind of genre orchestration, but you almost have to get caught not doing it. That's kind of the challenge and the fun of found footage, and I think one of the reasons it's persisted. So having the opportunity to come back and do a found footage piece, I was like, yeah, we can do this documentary, but we're going to do like seven minutes just like... Uh, full-on found footage immersion at the end of it, just for us, just because we want to get to do it. So that was the spirit of coming back to the end and um, uh, showing the audience the raw, unedited tape as a kind of counterpoint to what we'd seen in Total Copy and maybe serves as its own sort of tape. But, uh, yeah. You mentioned the challenge, I think, of this, of this style, of this mode. I'm curious to hear from everyone else about your approach to it and kind of, you know, we have new segments, we have teenage home video, we have very static performance art, kind of what was your approach in the filmmaking of your respective segments? Uh, yeah, um, uh, well, I, I think I had it the easiest because it's supposed to look like like a, like somebody who doesn't know what, really what they're doing like made it. Um, and so like for me, it was about trying to make the, um, you know, the, like the actual apparatus feel, um, you know, proper, but like a lot of the cameras from like 1999 are like very like they're old pieces of, of gear. I mean, they're similar to the ones from you know the '80s. And so when you're shooting on all this vintage stuff, like it it tends to kind of die as you're using it. Like we kept like using like um, you know cameras, and they would uh, you know like the pixel the, the pixels would start dying, you know like like the individual ones, and then we'd be like, what the hell is that, you know? And then realize that it was it was all um, you know an, an analog or, or like kind of you know it, the thing is actually breaking as you're using it, and so. Um, uh, like once you kind of have that certain vibe, then realizing like, well, what about this 
um, you know, like the cameras from the area that I was working in had like this um, thing called the uh, like optical image stabilizer, where it's like w when you're like zoomed in, it would it would try and correct for like the camera shake, and you could like turn that off and on, and, and it would make it like a lot more unstable. And we we're trying to figure out like, well, that's actually a really interesting property about uh, of the 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 camera from like a cinematographic um, perspective it makes things really tense. And so we could kind of like employ that at various times to kind of you know um, you know make it make it more and less you know um, interesting to what it what it was. But um, it's a bit of a battle with technology. So. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. I feel like the hardest the the hardest part of found footage for me is the fact that a lot of it ends up being a one -er, which I, I always found very difficult in traditional filmmaking. Like I always felt like that was actually a weakness of mine in film school. I remember we had a teacher have us all shoot a scene in a single shot and he tore mine apart because it was terrible. Uh, so it it's the challenge is, like David said, like you have to find beats within it, um, but at the same time you have to make it seem very natural. So I remember in 94, by the time we get into the, the sort of main enclave of these storm drain dwellers and the camera pretty much we wanted, of course it, we'd you know, stitched together some things but it had to look like it was one continuous take. We did a lot of rehearsals for it just to figure out you know, practically like how do we block people to camera within that, how do we find the beats? And in some ways that's, you know, the tricky part is how do you do that, make it very planned but also because it's found footage, make it seem very natural and like this is all sort of like playing out in real time and, and you buy it and yet there's an elegance to it. And you know, I, I feel like, like Bruckner did it so well in Total Copy, like Wreck was a really big influence for Storm Drain because of the news story and when people do it really well, it's, it's really special and really impressive. But yeah, I, I find it incredibly challenging. Yeah, I think it sounds funny, but found footage is really intimidating. I, I think we all love we all love making cinema, and we love film language, and we love making cinematic pieces. Um, and so to come at it and completely throw out your bag of tricks is, in a lot of ways, very scary. Um, but ultimately, I think it was a really liberating experience. And to come at the puzzle, the the sort of mountain that you're climbing when you're making something and throwing away your usual, your, your tools um, ended up being very liberating and exciting in the end. I think specifically for our piece, we made a one woman show. So we actually just started, everything was just a one woman show. We rehearsed it with her. She could run, she ran the whole thing. I think it was about 22 minutes or something, start to finish. Um, you know, we had live, our composer, uh, we actually put together some, uh, some, some samples, some audio samples ahead of time that were linked to pedals that she was manipulating live. She had a dual mic, um, which all of those techniques are also drawn from actual 80s and 90s performance art. Um, there's an artist named Diamanda Gallus who uh, has a piece called The Litanies of Satan uh, from the late 80s. That was a big influence for us. So we just, we just literally made a one-woman show and then archived it, <laughs> you know? And, and that's really... Um, that's really was our approach, which of course is completely antithetical to how you you know you put a, a normal traditional movie together. So it was really exciting. It's also I just want to add like it's not just you know that the, you have to orchestrate these oneers, you have to provide context for the camera necessarily. And let me add quickly, you know, a lot of standard movie performances don't hold up in found footage. Like if you start talking like you're in a movie, like it might look it might look appropriate if you're looking at. Yeah, you know, if you're looking at movie proper cinematography, but you put it in found footage and it's just it's just dead on its feet. You don't buy it. Um, it's the same with lighting. It's the same with production design. It's like everything has to be embedded. But I think it's probably the hardest in doing horror because there's such a premium on practical gags. Like everybody here has got, you know, monsters in their movie. They've got huge pra uh, practical like blood and gore bits. And that stuff traditionally is built from coverage. Like you shoot lots of little snippets and cut it together so as to create the illusion that it's actually happening and also to kind of hide the seams of a practical gag. And in VHS, you gotta figure out how to do it without that. The camera's gotta hang on it or you gotta motivate a way to steer the camera away from it or drop the camera or only show the audience flash bits of the stuff that works. And so uh, it can be a real challenge to shoot around that necessarily and I think I mean, I think I speak for everybody, like that's part of the draw to it is like, can I pull this off? Totally, and you also kind of like have to make it work for the story, like in the context of, like in ours we had a, um, like the, uh, the lead actor operated the camera 
like 90% of the movie, which is not usual, and they're really uncomfortable doing. Um, but, uh, but it was, you know, like, you, we kind of had to, like, sort of walk him through all the compositions and stuff like that, and thankfully he was just really excited about doing it and worked hard to, to do it, but it, it, it helped, it, you know, kind of feel natural for everybody, you know, and, and you kind of have to figure out how you're going to create, you know, that reality. And I want to embrace that energy. Like, I think that's something I want to bring into even, like, traditional, traditionally made films. Like, that energy of, can this stand up on its own? Can you have a three-minute take that leads up to this prosthetic, and it feels satisfying, and people have a reaction to it? Like, that is absolutely something that I want to bring into my future work as well. So we're going to go to audience questions in a minute. But first, Natasha, starting with you, I want to know what everyone's favorite VHS segment is. We've got six movies proper. Uh, don't be magnanimous. Choose one. <laughs> um, I have to embarrass David Bruckner because Amateur Night is really was very exciting for me. I had been familiar with Dave's work and a lot of the work of the filmmakers and like their the polished versions of their work. And so for me, it was really exciting to see someone whose work I considered very polished do something really like down and dirty and um, just like the liberation of throwing the camera up in the sky for like no ostensible reason um, was really exciting um, and liberating. And I also want to shout out to 85's Mike P. Nelson's piece. Yes. Every time I see that piece, I love it more. So everyone go watch 85 again and, and, and just, Mike's piece is really, it's, it's, really um, it's really intense, it's fun, but it's intense. And I think uh, it, it is having a dialogue again, that 85 to 2023 dialogue I think is really present in his piece and I, I love it, so. Uh, yeah, um, whoa. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> Thank Jump you scare. for coming out. Uh, <laughs> Not done there yet. <laughs> This panel is about to become a VHS segment. Yeah. <laughs> You're all in so the second. This is a performance art thing. Yeah, yeah. This is the sequel. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah. So I, actually, I mean, I, I my favorite segments uh, to Helen back uh, on VHS 99, which is a bit, you know, yeah, right. I mean, yeah, the the winters uh, uh, kill, uh, killed it. If you haven't seen Deadstream, go check it out. But like, I mean, and it's a little weird, weird because I mean, I, I'm a horror comedy guy, so and I really like that the one I got to be on was, was very much kind of slanted that way. But, but I, I mean, I love their segment more and it's right. I, I'm just glad that I didn't have to follow that act because it's awesome. Um, for me, I'd say it's, it's a, a, a total toss up between Amateur Night and Safe Haven. Oh shit. Uh, I'm gonna go with Veggie Masher. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> I love them all. And it's like, I'm so close to so many of these. I've gotten to work with like 15, 16 filmmakers just over the course of the past three years. So every segment, I know it's a shit answer, but I love every segment so much. Yeah, I really can't. I mean, this is, it's just, it's fucking impossible. I mean, I, I think, I feel like not enough has been said about Parallel Monsters. Yes. That's one that Natural I think about a lot. Yeah. That was in VHS Viral, which I think is often considered uh, one of the more under-seen ones. But it has Nacho, it has Justin Benson, Aaron Moorhead, Greg Bishop, a really terrific lineup of filmmakers. Um, let's play that so you can see a little bit of VHS 85. And then anyone uh, who has an audience question, I believe you should line up. And then if you have a favorite VHS segment, you should tell us what it is and then ask your question. Thank you. I can't see, are there questions? Someone's coming. Oh yeah, right there at the microphone, hello. Hi, um, is, it? is this on? Yes. Cool, right on. Um, Ratman keeps me up at night. I told my roommate and now she won't watch it with me. Um, so that's fun. Um, I have a question actually about ending. So. In horror, and I think especially in short form horror, and especially, especially in short form horror that kind of plays with where the boundaries of the piece are and, and the bigger form, what do you think are sort of the ingredients for making an ending that has an impact, making an impact that feels satisfying, and making an, an ending that people are, that it's gonna stay with people? So. so this is a question about endings in horror films um, and those that make impact. And anyone who would like to jump in, please do. I think horror and comedy are the same. So it has to be the punchline, especially with short form. 
Um, so it's the last shot that makes everything else work, like a joke. It's easier to kill off all your characters in a short film. <laughs> Fact. Anyone else want to hop in? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I try and go big, but it doesn't always work. But uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, you know, I think it's a good point that uh, uh, that you know, horror and comedy are are you know such you know kind of two sides of the same coin in that it's you know like they're both grounded in misdirection. So you're like constantly looking for that way to surprise people and you know save your biggest surprise for the end. I also think like oh, I'm sorry. Come on. Oh yeah, no. I was just gonna say I, I, I think actually like on a script level, Storm Drain ended differently, and you and Miska encouraged me to like push it, which was great, and and obviously ended up so much better than the crappy ending I had before. But I think a lot of it was like, you know, yeah, it's it's the element of surprise, and even the nice thing about shorts is I feel like you can get away with a more drastic tonal shift, which can work really nicely. Um, in this format and not always in, in feature length. But yes, I think subversion of expectations always helps. Yeah, I think and um, our, our editor, Gabe uh, Dirioste, and the writer both, um, at the end of Techno God, we knew that there was going to be applause at the end. But we didn't, I think, until we saw the, images, the image just juxtaposed with that applause that we really felt like, OK, that's our punchline. And we're giving our character a happy ending. <laughs> She sacrificed herself at the altar of performance, but she got you know a round of applause at the end. So, let's go right there. Uh, thanks for coming, and this has been an awesome panel so far. Uh, I love Stormgrain, so there's the. Uh, and uh, the question is, if you guys could go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice when you were making your first feature, what would it be? Uh, as for all the filmmakers, if you can go back in time and give yourself advice making your first feature, what would it be? This is so, so like basic, but like truly just trust your instincts. Because I find as a director, you know, in some ways you're every, everyone else around you is an expert at what they do and you're sort of a jack of all trades. And I, I, I think it can be very easy to have that little voice in your head that says, well, what the fuck do I know? This person obviously knows more than me, so I should defer to them. Um, and you should almost... I mean, not never listen to that voice, like listen to your collaborators, they know what they're talking about. But um, I, I really do feel like what I would tell myself, what I would tell anyone is like, you, you have your vision, there's a reason that you're directing this in a way that nobody else can, and the choices that you make, even if other people push back or don't understand them, like that's ultimately what is gonna make your movie special. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's what I'd say. Yeah, and, and if you're making a first feature these days, like chances are it's not, you know, it's not a very expensive thing because usually, like, I mean, that's, I, I, there's not very many big budget first features being made at all right now, and so like, you know, you got to take that swing as much as you, as you can, like, and um, you know, like, I mean, my first movie was like a, you know, like a hundred thousand dollar, like, you know, small like Frankenstein movie, and it was really, uh, you know, like, it, it, like if you do a movie kind of at that level. Like you, you, you kind of have to make it your own, or else you know, like I mean, you're never gonna get that chance again. You know, like and so, um, you know, people, especially in horror, like they want to see how you do it differently, and they want to see what makes your cabin in the woods different. You know, and and I think that's really freeing for for, for the genre. So I'd say just you know, like you know, um, you know, it's somewhere to follow your instincts, but I would just say like swing, swing big. Do not dip into your personal savings account. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Awesome, thank you so much. Right there. Hello, so I would have to say Ozzy's Dungeon, which I'm representing. <laughs> oh it's yeah. one of my favorites. So in 85, it's, this is the first time we've seen like a two part s sequence. What was the conversation like producing that and is that something we would see more of in future installments? So the question is about the structure of VHS 85, which includes a segment that is split in some ways and allows you to discover how they're related. Josh, you want to talk about that structure? Yeah, I, you know, we, uh, we dipped into it a bit in, uh, in 99. You know, we always joked behind the scenes. It's like, you know, after asking Jennifer Reeder to do the wraparound segment in 94, we were like, I don't know that I ever want to approach another film filmmaker and be like, hey, do the wraparound segment. So I think for us, it was like growing up, you know, in the 90s and like watching VHS tapes and like going through like my dad's collection. There was, it was very organic to, well, 
it was very common for me to see like my favorite programs taped over other programs. And so I think that's what we were trying to get back to. And just like trying to figure out new like creative ways for us to proceed in this VHS universe that we've created and do something that like didn't feel gimmicky but, de but felt organic. And we started that with Tyler's, but you know, it was all coming together like very last minute. And I'm not sure that like we felt full, like Tyler did an incredible job. I love his segment, but it was about, it was about like, how, how can we, a continuation of that? How can we, how can we build upon that? Which is also why we did 99 coming out of 94 was like, we feel like we have something left in the nineties, you know? And so Tyler, you, you were about to hop in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think the like the splitting it into two parts. Like, you guys had a very logical midpoint that was cool to kind of do like both both sides. Whereas, like, we had more like downhill maneuvering to do right. that was more around trying to balance the the whole overall thing. But yeah, yeah, but it was Mike that I think it was sort of a, a proposition we threw out of the filmmakers was like think out of the box. You know, you don't you can do a longer short. You can do a shorter short. Like, what if there were shorter? You know, what if there was a seven minute short? You know, I mean, could we could we support that? Um, and then what if we broke it up in some ways? So we kind of were able to come in off 99 into the beginning of 85 and say, what does this inspire? And I think Mike just ran with it, came in, and I believe he just showed up with two scripts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it's the difficult part of, of doing the wraparound is that, like, there's so much story in these movies. We throw a lot at the wall. And it's like, how, how do you tell a story when you're being interrupted by like four more stories? And how do you make the audience care? And how do you make those sequences memorable so that like it connects as you move along? So that's the constant journey that we're on, trying to figure that out. And I, 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 I'm beyond proud of what we did within 99 and 85. And you know, uh, maybe if we make another one, we'll explore some more things. Right there. Thank you. Hi. Um, I guess my favorite, they're probably tied between 85 and 99. Um, but my question actually is, uh, at first, I'm really glad that you mentioned that like horror is a bit like comedy. Um, I've always wanted to know, do you struggle with like pacing? Since like, you know, in comedy, they always say like, you know, timing is everything. Does pacing become something that like it, you focus really heavily on? Or is it something that becomes organic as you're going through the process? So the question is, how, how do you all approach pacing in a VHS short, and how significant is, is it to you? I mean, I feel like it's the name of the game in filmmaking in general. And the thing that nobody ever told me getting into this was that it's going to be the hardest part sometimes, because the first thing that you're going to lose perspective on is pace, because you're staring at something that you've stared at a million times over. So you can't see it anymore. You can't see your own movies. So in a weird way, it's a kind of act of faith that some of this is necessarily landing. And I think particularly in a short, which sort of introduces the audience to the, in an anthology, introduces the audience to a short attention span kind of universe, you have to figure out how to get to the beats without breaking the credibility of the found footage shtick. It's like, you know, you can just cut, but then you lose the persistence, the immersion of the whole thing to some degree. So I think more so uh, in found footage than anything else, you're trying to find ways to control the pace without breaking the illusion. So we always talk about you can always cut on a whip pan. So it's like, how does your cameraman, like, they have something to look at over here and something to look at over there because every time they whip back and forth, you can get in and out of the edit. And so you're trying to find a way from the ground up to orchestrate how to interpret pace um, uh, when you don't know where you're going to land yet. So it's, it, I'd say it's a very fluid process for me at least. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I used to be an editor, so I'm always like trying to chop things up in my head. But weirdly, my segment doesn't have any actual edits in it. Like they're all just oneers, and I have a ton of whip pans that I never even cut on because I didn't because I liked the one take. So it's you know it can be quite frustrating in that sense. Okay, thank you. Right there. I apologize in advance if this question is a sore subject, but David, um, I'm really curious, and it's today of all days. Um, I know at one point you were doing a Friday the 13th found footage movie, and that obviously didn't happen. So I'm just curious how you feel about that. Sure. Uh, I'll make it quick because it's not really VHS, but I'll say yeah. I never thought a found footage Friday the 13th would work. I just took the job because 
I thought we'd find our way out of it, and we did. And, uh, and then the studio president came to his senses and said, this is never gonna work. And we said, I know. And so then we, uh, we did a proper found footage 3D script that I do love that we never got to make. So, I mean, you can't do slasher and found footage. No, I agree, yeah. Unless everybody's got a camera and they're wandering off and getting killed and <laughs> dropping multiple tapes. So it was a conundrum, but I needed a job. Multiple tapes. Like, that's a wraparound. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yes, and for the record, my favorite segment was Radio Silences from the first one. Awesome. Right on. And right there. Ooh, uh, I have a question regarding marketing. I don't know if that's applicable to you guys, but I thought I'd ask. Uh, I love the tactile aspect of the whole VHS series. You know, you're, you're making this tape. It's all this chunky technology, like big cameras and... VHSs and all that, and I was wondering if you were planning on expanding that in some way. Like, I love the idea of something called VHS, like mixtape or VHS, VHS eight track or something like that. That would some have something to do with like the plot for the next short or something. I, I wasn't sure if that was something you ever had in mind, but mm, thought I'd ask. Uh, I mean, we joke about it all the time. I think you know, the DVD, fucking. <laughs> I, think, I think I just texted one of our co-producers like. With all the slashes, IMAX, like, text. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I mean, it's always, I, that, it's just kind of the fun of making these movies is, you know, maybe one day we'll, we'll do something completely fucking ridiculous and it'll still be wonderful somehow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's just a lot of fun to be had with the handmade aspect. Like, anybody can make a mixtape, right? Right. So, yeah, last thing, question. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say one thing nobody ever talks about is the editor. Who is constructing all of this for the audience? Anyway, I leave that to you. Last question right here. Hi, I'm Brian. Uh, Hail Ratma. Um, Hail Ratma. <laughs> Hail Ratma. Um, I guess, you know, uh, as, as a genre, genre film is just so laden with subtext and, and, and trying to reflect our world in a different way thematically. Uh, when it comes to horror or even, you know, future VHS potential um, movies, what themes uh, would you like to explore more within those short segments or in your future work in general? Questions: What themes do we want to explore? In our yeah, future? themes that may potentially. All of them. I mean, yeah, that that what it's interests could lead in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The clock's ticking down. You got to got to answer big. It's not really a theme, but I just want to say I think science fiction horror is massively underserved. <laughs> it's it's interesting you say that. Uh, you know, VHS has become an annual tradition on Shutter, and next year will be no different. Josh, you want to tell us a little bit about where we're going next? Yeah, sure. Uh, we're making another VHS movie. Uh, it's a perfect, it's like we planted you for this. <laughs> um, you know, behind the scenes, we're always talking about like things that are exciting. We're, it's not lost on us that we're going into part seven. And so we took a look at like some other franchises that got to part seven, Hellraiser, uh, Friday the 13th, um, Dracula, arguably, <laughs> Leprechaun, uh, Amityville Horror. And so we're just gonna follow in their footsteps and take this motherfucker to outer space. <laughs> but we're also very excited about just exploring science fiction. And so it's gonna be beyond outer space as well, but that was kind of like what brought us to sci-fi horror. There's so many uh, incredible science fiction horror movies, and we just want, really want to lean into the terror of that. So we'll be back next year with another VHS. Everyone, thank you so much for coming, for your time. VHS 85 is now on Shudder. VHS 99 is now on Shudder. VHS 94 is now on Shudder. It's a Wonderful Knife, directed by Tyler McIntyre, coming to theaters and it's to Shudder this December. Yeah, yeah, November 10th in theaters. <laughs> Natasha Kermani's Lucky, now on Shudder. Chloe Akuna's Watcher, now on Shudder. Thank you all. <laughs>